Greetings again, everybody. We're going to talk about uh, some more hernias here. I talked about uh, the inguinal hernias in another section, both direct and indirect inguinal hernias. Those are the most common hernias seen in surgical practice in the United States. Uh, but here we're going to talk about uh, some more non-inguinal hernias. Uh, so we're going to talk about the femoral, incisional, and umbilical hernias. And together, they probably make up about 10 to 15 percent of all the hernias that are seen in surgical practice in the U.S. Uh, so the inguinal hernias definitely carry uh, the most weight. But these are important, too, especially for USMLE questions, because it's not always common things that come up on the USMLE. Sometimes you get some of the zebras, too, some of the less common things. So it is worth talking about these hernias. All right, so general principles of hernias. These are abnormal protrusions of intra-abdominal contents through a relatively weakened portion of the abdominal wall. So this can be acquired or it can just be uh, congenital. So uh, in the cases where it's congenital, there is really no reason why the patient gets it. Like, for instance, an umbilical hernia. There's no, nothing that the child did to get an umbilical hernia. Uh, where on the other hand, with uh, acquired hernias, there are uh, things that caused busting down of the tissue that allows the uh, abdominal contents to protrude into another cavity. So hernias uh, can be caused by, and they're always aggravated by, increased intra-abdominal pressure. So anything that increases pressure in your abdomen. Uh, and those things can be straining, coughing, lifting, constipation, COPD, pregnancy, ascites, or just generally obesity uh, because the, the, the weight from the fat is putting pressure on the abdominal area, which is still a fixed uh, space. So uh, when you're thinking uh, some of these things, these are a lot of the things that happen in older age. So maybe not pregnancy, but COPD and ascites, obesity, more common in older people. Uh, straining can come from constipation, more common in older people. Coughing can come from COPD, that's more common in older people. Uh, and then just also in general, aging is a risk factor for most hernias as well. Lifting, definitely think of just in older people doing lifting. Uh, they may be lifting more than what they should, uh, but also lifting as in weightlifting. Younger guys who go to the gym and are trying to bench press 250 pounds, yes, that can cause a hernia. So the types of hernias kind of went over that uh, earlier. The inguinal area hernias, that's what I like to call them, that's indirect hernia, direct hernia, uh, which we talked about uh, in the other section, and also femoral hernias, which we'll talk about here. Uh, the difference with femoral hernias is that it's not through, uh, it doesn't involve the inguinal canal at all, it just uh, goes underneath the inguinal ligament. So they can be confused uh, because they're in the same area. but. Uh, these three make together about 75 to 80 percent of all hernias uh, seen in the U.S. Incisional hernias are the next most common, which we'll talk about here, and then umbilical hernias. Uh, and this is primarily a problem of pediatrics. Some of the other hernias are much more rare. Uh, they include uh, spagellian, obturator, and epigastric hernias. And these combined make up less than one percent of all hernias. So some vocabulary words worth knowing for hernias. So a reducible hernia is a hernia which the contents can be manipulated uh, back into the abdomen. So you have a hernia, but it can be pushed back into the abdomen. And you could either have a hernia that's out all the time, but you can push it back into the abdomen. That's a reducible hernia. Or you may have a hernia where it only comes out once in a while. Maybe, for instance, when you cough. The hernia can be seen, but then it spontaneously reduces. Either or, they're reducible hernias. Now, the opposite of a reducible hernia is an incarcerated hernia, and this is where the hernia, hernia contents can't be pushed back into the abdomen. And once you go from reducible to incarcerated, you have reached a much different, uh, more severe uh, stage surgically, because when the hernia becomes incarcerated, it's now at risk of being strangulated. And a strangulated hernia 
uh, is a surgical emergency. So when a hernia becomes strangulated, what happens is that the tissue that's in the hernia, hernia sac becomes ischemic and necrotic because of the loss of blood flow. So where the hernia is coming out of, the, the uh, compensated tissue or the, the hernia is bulging from, you've got uh, pressure there that's compressing on the arteries and on the veins, and so you get a loss of blood flow, and when you get that loss of blood flow, then you get ischemia and necrosis. And ultimately, this can lead to perforation, and so this is going to cause just generalized signs of peritoneal infection, and so that's going to be things like pain and fever and nausea and vomiting, and also a color change in the hernia as well. And of course, it's going to be an incarcerated hernia. All strangulated hernias are incarcerated, and so uh, you, you also may see a color change, and you won't be able to uh, you won't be able to manipulate the hernia back into the abdominal cavity. An obstructing hernia uh, is usually uh, also an incarcerated hernia, but it can also be a reducible hernia. And this is where small bowel, which is usually what's in the hernia sac, becomes obstructed because of the kink that forms, the, the angle that forms in the hernia sac. Uh, so this causes a small bowel obstruction, which is one of the complications of hernias. All right, so just anatomically to uh, reacquaint ourselves, uh, the inguinal ligament is going to be important both when we're thinking about inguinal hernias, of course, as the name would imply, and when we're thinking about femoral hernias. So the inguinal ligament is a ligament that extends on your hip from your anterior superior iliac spine, and it's anterior, even though you can't see it, uh, this portion of the iliac crest is coming out at you. It's, it's, uh, it's more anterior than the rest of the iliac crest, which moves posteriorly. Uh, so this is your anterior superior iliac spine here, and it runs from there to the pubic crest, right here. So that's the inguinal ligament. Now the femoral canal is going to be important when we think about femoral hernias because it's the femoral canal through which a femoral hernia will protrude. So you see here we have the inguinal ligament, the anterior superior iliac spine, and the pelvic uh, tubercle where the uh, inguinal ligament uh, runs from. So here's our inguinal ligament here. Underneath the inguinal ligament we have uh, femoral vessels uh, and the femoral canal. So your femoral artery and your femoral vein run inferior to the uh, inguinal ligament, and then your femoral canal runs inferior to your inguinal ligament, and they kind of come together in a structure. And if you remember uh, the mnemonic uh, navel, uh, N-A-V-E-L, uh, that's that will help you with. Uh, knowing that you've got your nerve and your artery, your vein, your lymphatics. So uh, here's your femoral canal. Uh, this is actually carrying deep inguinal lymph nodes. So that's what the femoral canal is for. All right. Uh, so the problem with femoral hernias is when you get a protrusion through the femoral canal and it progresses down the femoral sheath. And that's sort of what covers up uh, your vessels and uh, your uh, lymphatics. So this is going to protrude inferior posterior to the inguinal ligament and anterior to the pect uh, pectineal ligament and the pubic ramus. So here's your pectineal ligament right here and your pubic ramus here. So it's going to be in between those structures. Right. Uh, so this can also continue through the saphenous opening. So your femoral vessel gives rise to your saphenous vessel, and there's uh, so that's there, there's going to be an interruption of the femoral sheath there. And indeed, if you have a hernia, it can also continue through uh, that saphenous opening. Now, unlike the inguinal hernias, and this is a big one to remember: femoral hernias are more common in women than in men. So this is, a, this is a hernia that is more common in women than men, and there's not many hernias that are like that. So this is something to remember about the femoral hernia. And what that has to do with is the shape of the, uh, of the, the hip bones.
This is an acquired lesion, so this is not something that's going to happen in pediatrics. Uh, this is something that happens because of something else that happens in life. So usually due to a history of pregnancy, multiple pregnancies, or due to a history of hernia repair, you can compromise the, uh, the femoral sheath. The presentation is going to be similar to the inguinal hernias in that you have a inguinal area mass. So it's going to be very similar in appearance uh, on presentation to a direct inguinal hernia. What's going to help you differentiate them, if you can, and it's not always possible to differentiate them on physical exam, uh, is the location. So if you can palpate the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic ramus and you can palpate the inguinal ligament, a femoral hernia is going to be inferior below the inguinal ligament, whereas an indirect, whereas a direct uh, 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 inguinal hernia is going to be above, or roughly at the level of the uh, of the inguinal ligament. So, because the treatment is the same as what we would do for indirect or direct inguinal hernias it's generally not necessary to come to a complete conclusion of whether this is a femoral hernia or an inguinal hernia. And so therefore imaging is usually unnecessary. The only time imaging is usually done clinically is in uh, overweight patients where it's very difficult to sort of palpate where things are at. Uh, but for the USMLE, imaging is unnecessary for uh, diagnosis of femoral uh, or inguinal hernias. You, this can be diagnosed clinically. And most of the time, uh, I mean, a lot of times you do have a diagnosis and it's right on uh, when, after, you, after you do the surgery, but in some cases you may diagnose it as a direct inguinal hernia and you get in there and then you see, oh no, this is actually a femoral hernia. Once you get in there, it's very obvious what it is, but on physical exam, it might, they might be confused. That's okay because the treatment is the same. But on the USMLE, you should know that if they say that it's a bulge inferior to the inguinal ligament, this is a femoral hernia. If it's at the inguinal ligament uh, or the inguinal canal, then it's going to be an inguinal hernia of one type or the other. So here's a femoral hernia. Actually, I think there's two on both sides, but the one on the right here is more obvious. So here's your inguinal ligament. You've got your anterior superior iliac spine here. Inguinal ligament travels down here to the, the pubic uh, ramus. So right here is your femoral hernia. Now, if you were to have an indirect inguinal hernia, it would be up here. If it was direct, it would be a little bit, probably in between those two. So this is a femoral hernia. There's another much more severe femoral hernia. Again, there's two here. Uh, so again, for, uh, this. So this one's much bigger, but it's kind of hard to see the inguinal ligament. The inguinal ligament, when you look at a lean patient, it's much easier to see it. It's sort of that, that V line that runs uh, down the lower part of the abdomen. But here is your inguinal ligament here. This is a femoral hernia right here. It's kind of hard to see it here on this side. Here it is on a female. Hard to see the inguinal ligament here, but it's progressing down. This would be very difficult to, uh, to differentiate, especially in a female, to differentiate from an indirect inguinal hernia, uh, just because it's going into uh, the vaginal area. Uh, but like I said, it's not necessary to know the difference. You're going to do surgery, it's going to be in the same area, and you'll know once you get in there. Uh, you probably know that this is not an indirect inguinal hernia, though, because indirect inguinal hernias practically never happen in women. Okay, so an incisional hernia. Now, unlike some of those other hernias, an incisional hernia is very obvious that it's an incisional hernia because this is a complication of surgery, um, particularly of abdominal surgery, and it occurs in about 5 to 10% of incisions, although I'd like to think it's less than that. That number really surprised me when I when I saw it. Uh, but all you're getting here is poor healing of the incision and what happens then is abdominal contents are protruding through a healed incision. Now this is an acquired lesion of course because it's caused from the surgery itself and some of the things that put you at risk for an incisional hernia include having a midline incision. So a midline incision would be down the linea elba. 
the linea alba is in between your recti muscles, your dominus recti muscles. And that's actually a weakened, uh, slightly weak area of the abdomen, just because it's not muscle, it's just the sheath. So uh, a midline incision is more likely to get an incisional hernia than other incisions. Um, if there's a post-operative incision site infection or hematoma, that's going to interfere with the healing process, and so that can be a risk factor for hernia. Malnutrition, just because if you're malnourished, that's going to make healing uh, more difficult. And then poor suturing technique for obvious reasons, and anything that causes increased intra-abdominal pressure. The diagnosis is going to be apparent based on the fact that they've had uh, history of, uh, of, of surgery, uh, that they uh, have an incision scar there, usually you can see that most of the time, and then on physical exam. Now it's very important to know this is not the same as wound evisceration. Now a wound evisceration is a complication of surgery, but what you have with a wound evisceration is abdominal contents being expelled out of the body. That's totally different from a hernia. With a hernia you have uh, you have it's covered by skin, so you don't have it's not the same thing as visceration where you're getting intestine just spilling out of the wound. So, for instance, you could get a midline incision, but a few days afterwards you can get wound evisceration because the uh, it, the incision never healed. This is with the incisional hernia. It's a uh, relatively healed incision. That's why I put healed in quotation marks. It appears to be healed but it's not completely healed and so you get herniation. There's a, you've, you've, you've healed the abdominal wall, but it's weaker now and so you have a hernia. With a wound evisceration, it didn't ever really heal at all and so the abdominal contents just get spilled out. Now it's very clinically obvious when you come in and you see a, uh, an evisceration because you've got intestine all, laying all over the place. Uh, that's different from a hernia where you just have sort of a bulge. But I just thought I'd bring that up. Um, and that wound evisceration, uh, unlike incisional hernia, is always a surgical emergency. You're going to want to cover the intestine with moist, sterile uh, gauze or tissue, and that patient's going to be sent in for immediate surgery. Okay, uh, treatment for incisional hernias consists of her herniorophy, and that's going to be done after the patient has finished recovering from the initial surgery. So it's not an emergency that, uh, that in incisional hernias are repaired right away. The reason it's not really urgent is because usually when you have a, an incision, it's somewhat large, at least two or three, maybe four or six centimeters long. And it's hard to get incarceration uh, through a, uh, an opening that large. So um, this makes it less of a risk for incarceration and complications. So that you can usually wait, and it's generally best to wait uh, for the patient to recover from the initial surgery and then to fix the hernia. So here's an incisional hernia, very obvious here because you've got a scar here and a hernia here and not sure what this surgery was for but it's very possible that this could have been a traditional c-section it appears to be a woman uh, and this would be right around where you would make the incision for a traditional c-section now we do the fan and steel c-sections where we go across and the reason that that's good is because you can have a vaginal birth after that c-section it's possible with this kind you can't just a little ob guy note. So there's another incision here. This one is uh, even larger. You got hernia. And here's another one. Okay. Here's my dog. <laughs> this is, he's a little smaller here. He's got really big ears. Okay. Umbilical hernia. So uh, this is a protrusion of intra-abdominal contents through the navel. So this is also going to be somewhat obvious just based on its location. Uh, this is all, almost always due to a congenital defect, and, and it almost always is uh, in kids. Uh, 
So it can be acquired in adults uh, who have long-term increased intra-abdominal pressure, especially ascites, so liver failure patients. Uh, now in industrialized nations, this is primarily a problem of pediatrics, but in third world countries, non-industrialized developing nations, it can be a problem in adults because they had it when they were kids, when they were babies, and they never got it treated. And so it is a problem of adults in some countries. Uh, but in the U.S., where there is a higher standard of health care, it's primarily a problem of pediatrics. Now, 95% of the time, umbilical hernias will spontaneously regress by age 3. So this is not a problem that necessarily needs to be treated immediately. Uh, but it is something that the parent is going to note right away. Uh, it may even be noted uh, right away uh, when the patient, when the baby is, uh, is still uh, in postnatal care. So this is three times more common in males than in females, and there's a higher incidence among blacks. Now, why would you get an umbilical hernia? Why do you have an umbilicus? Why do you have a well? I should say, why do you have a navel? Remember, the navel, in addition to providing where the umbilicus goes in, this is also the position where around week 10, remember your abdominal organs, your, particularly your intestines, develop outside of your body. And around week 10 of gestation, they come back in to your abdominal cavity. Uh, and so in, in, some, in, in some patients, in some children, the uh, the umbilical area is not uh, as strong as in others, and so that's what causes umbilical hernia. But that's an area that's initially open uh, for some time during fetal development. Uh, you need to differentiate this from a peri-umbilical hernia. This is also a hernia. It's much more rare, uh, and this is uh, in the abdominal wall around it, usually on the midline. So it was a periumbilical hernia. Usually it's above the umbilicus. Again, it's going to be very obvious when you see it. It's not going to be in the belly button. It's going to be above it. In infants, uh, you have to differentiate this from an omphalocele. Again, this is somewhat obvious when you see it, but it's very different. Uh, and this, rather than having a hernia that's covered by skin, you have a sac of intestine. Uh, and that shiny sac is peritoneum. So this will be visibly obvious at birth. As a matter of fact, now we usually can diagnose this before birth uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, sonography. I'll show you a picture of an omphalocele. It'll be clear as day. The treatment of umbilical hernia depends on the age. In all adults, it's going to be surgical treatment. In kids, if they're babies, we wait until they're three years old. Once they hit age three, if it hasn't regressed, then uh, we will put it back in surgically. Um, but before age three, we just sit and wait because 95% of the time they will spontaneously regress. The only time we operate on children under the age of three is, of course, if there are complications. And complications would include incarceration. We are not able to get the, uh, the hernia back into the abdominal cavity. Of course, strangulation. Uh, and then uh, a, a bowel obstruction. So, of course, it's going to be really important to remind the parents, educate the parents, uh, that if you can't get the hernia back in to the kid's belly, uh, you need to uh, be seen. If there's any color changes, if there's bowel obstruction, etc. Right, about 95% will regress by age 3. So here's a baby with an umbilical hernia. And a lot of times you only see the umbilical hernia when the baby is crying or coughing or having a bowel movement, and then it might just regress right back in. So uh, it's, it's not going to necessarily always be there, so you may have to watch for it. But the parent, parents will bring them in because parents see their kids all the time. Never doubt parents when they're talking about their kids. That's something that you should learn at, at least by the time you're in residency. Okay, here's another umbilical hernia, a little bit smaller on this kid. You can see that's a little boy. Umbilical hernia is a little bit more common in boys. Uh, 
And here's another umbilical hernia. Again, these are all healthy appearing hernias. They're not discolored. The kid's not in pain, not writhing. So we watch these. Here's a hernia in an adult. So probably an adult because there's hair here, definitely over the age of three. And so this is going to be operated on because this will not regress. And here's a very big hernia, possibly incarcerated. Can't tell, I just saw the picture. I didn't read up on the patient, but there's some color changes here. You can see some uh, engorged veins. So there may be a little bit of incarceration. And this is an omphalocele, so obviously not an umbilical hernia, but it's kind of on that continuum of things protruding out of the, uh, the umbilicus. So uh, this is much different. This needs to be treated inpatient. It's always treated. You're never going to send these kids home, obviously, obviously. Okay, but I just thought I'd point this out. All right, so some other hernias. Uh, now remember what I said earlier, uh, all the hernias up until now are 99% of the hernias you'll ever see. These are less than 1%, these three, plus there's some other ones that I'm not even going to talk about because they're even more rare, but these three are less than 1% of all the hernias that come in. So they're not as important when you're thinking at a numbers level, when you're, especially when you're thinking for the USMLE. So these are sort of, uh, this is sort of, uh, what, what could you say, ancillary hernias for the USMLP. So an epigastric hernia is a hernia uh, through the linea elba. Uh, usually, we're well, thinking through the linea elba, um, thinking uh, higher up. Uh, so uh, this is usually uh, contents of the small bowel or possibly even stomach. Um, usually there's multiple when there's an epigastric hernia, there's multiple of them present at the same time. So this would be denoted by number one here. Uh, a spigelian hernia is a hernia of intra-abdominal contents infralateral to the navel. And the technical way of explaining this would be it's at the semilunar line uh, at the level of the arcuate line. Now, I don't like complex anatomic terms because they make it difficult to remember. So my sloppy way of remembering this is it's at the bottom lateral side of the six pack. So what's the six pack? It's the abdominal rectus muscle. Here's the bottom of the six pack. One, two, three. One, two, three. Here's your bottom of your six pack. Okay, infralateral. So right here, this is where your six pack ends. So, and this is where it ends uh, inferiorly, inferior lateral, right at this corner. So this is where you get a spigelian hernia. Some surgeons or anatomists might think I'm a heretic for saying it that way, but I just want to know where it's at. I'm not concerned about perfect anatomy. All right, obturator hernia, that is a hernia through the obturator foramen. So think of the hips, the hip bones, and when you're thinking of those pelvic bones there, remember down to the pelvis and the ischium, there's that hole. And that's the obturator foramen. And usually it's covered by a little bit of fascia, but that's a relatively weakened area because it's not, it's not supported by muscle or bone, just by fascia. And so you can get a hernia through there. Now, there's going to be something that sets this apart from some of the other hernias. Running along there also is the obturator nerve. And invariably, when you get an obturator hernia, uh, in addition to the mass that you may see, you're also going to get uh, compression of the obturator nerve, and that's going to cause pain along the mid-anterior thigh. So if you have a uh, groin mass with pain along the mid-anterior thigh, especially in a woman, because this is more common in women than in men, um, like the femoral hernia, uh, then this is, uh, this, this is going to be an obturator hernia until proven otherwise. So remember the obturator hernia, that uh, it's associated with pain uh, because of the obturator nerve. Okay. So just to recap, uh, we talked about the femoral incisional umbilical hernia. So the femoral hernia occurs below the inguinal ligament through the femoral canal. 
It uh, happens in females more than males. Usually, uh, this is always an acquired lesion. This is uh, caused especially for multiple pregnancies, history of hernia repair. The cause is increased intra-abdominal pressure. Symptoms are an inguinal area mass, plus or minus pain. Diagnosis is going to be just on history and physical exam, where it's at, below the inguinal ligament. Uh, but a lot of times it's going to be difficult to uh, diagnose it just on physical exam. Either way, the treatment is going to be herniorophy, just like your inguinal hernias, and at that point you can make an official post-operative diagnosis and treat it. The incisional hernia is much more obvious than uh, the inguinal and femoral hernias because this is at an incision site, and usually these patients will have a scar over that incision site. Patient population this happens in is post-operative patients, especially those who had a complicated uh, wound healing course. So if they got an infection in their wound, if they had a hematoma in their wound, if they had a, an intern or medical student suturing their wound, uh, no offense, uh, that could be a possibility that they may have uh, had poor healing. And so, uh, hell, if they had me, suturing their wound, they probably get poor healing. I don't suture wounds that much. Uh, so poor healing of the uh, incision uh, puts you at risk for an incisional hernia. And this is not the same as evisceration. This doesn't occur right after surgery. This can be two, three, four months after surgery. And the thing that's behind this is the fact that you just get poor healing and so you have a weakness uh, where that uh, incision was, rather than having a nice tight closure, you have a, a weakness uh, in your abdomen. You have an area of relative weakness, and so that will allow for a hernia. And the symptoms, of course, are going to be an abdominal mass over the incision site. Diagnosis is clinical based on history and symptoms. Treatment is going to be herniorrhaphy after the acute recovery from the surgery. The umbilical hernia occurs at the navel. And uh, the population this happens in is primarily pediatrics in the United States, although it can occasionally come up in adults as an acquired lesion um, because of increased intra-abdominal pressure. Cause, again, usually congenital in kids, uh, but it can be acquired. Symptoms, protrusion through the navel. So you have a hernia through the belly button. Boom, umbilical hernia. Diagnosis is clinical. Treatment is herniorrhaphy for any patient after the age of three. If there are, uh, if the patient is under the age of, three, um, usually it spontaneously regresses. 19 out of 20 times it does, uh, but if it doesn't, then we will operate after the third birthday. Or if there are complications, so a small bowel obstruction, if it becomes unreducible or uh, incarcerated, uh, or heaven forbid, or if there's, uh, like I said, a small bowel obstruction. In that case, uh, you would uh, you would want to uh, repair it. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, leave some comments down below.